Hello. Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. Were you not starting then? No, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I... You gave me a, you gave me the weirdest look when I said hello because I, I forgot my next line. Oh, oh, you you pulled a me. Okay, got yeah. it. It's fine. It's fine then. Yeah. <laughs> I just I was like, are you still testing the microphone? What just happened? No. Okay. I just lost all words okay no that's fine i just it freaked me out because i thought i was starting too early and i was like oh shit no (laughs) i just like tossed you a look like help you did too (laughs) and i was like what am i supposed to do here that's why i thought i started too early but okay yeah no you just did a me and like forgot literally the only like line that's scripted in this whole thing so yeah i mean we've only done this like 170 sometimes yeah it's fine okay It happens. Yeah. Well, today we are going to do part three of our story on Jonathan Luna. And I read The Midnight Ride of Jonathan Luna by William Kiesling and listened to Crime Junkie, two episodes of True Crime Garage, and Somebody Somewhere Season 3, which is 11 episodes. Got it. And I got a small recap for you. Warren Grace pled guilty to his crimes as instructed, and he was released on house arrest and allowed to become an FBI informant. He immediately broke every rule he was given, and both his FBI handler, Agent Skinner, and Jonathan Luna were forced to cover for him over and over. The FBI was supplying him with money to purchase heroin from Walter Poindexter and Dion Smith at Stash House Records. Warren Grace was supposed to be wearing an ankle monitor, but he was slipping out of it with Vaseline, and he was causing a lot of trouble around town. He was eventually caught and should have been sent back to prison, but the FBI got him out of this mess and had him officially released from his home confinement as well. The Smith and Poindexter trial began on December 1st of 2003, and Jonathan Luna was making several mistakes. He just wasn't acting like himself at all. He completely lost control of FBI informant Warren Grace during questioning, and Judge Quarles had to suggest that he use incentives to get him back in line and Court was adjourned for the day. So that is where we left off. Perfect. Too many names. I know. (laughs) Too many names, otherwise I'd recap it. Okay. Maybe some other time. Yeah, no, it's just like when there's so many names involved, it's actually really difficult to do. (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, even for me, going through this story, I'm like, who's who again? Yeah. Yep. (laughs) It was kind of hard to organize everything, but we got there. So when they met back in court... Jonathan Luna was way off the mark again, and the judge was clearly upset and called him out for wasting his time. He threatened to talk to his boss about this, which definitely would have been worst case scenario because Thomas DiBaggio had already made it clear that he wanted Jonathan Luna gone, and Jonathan had to hire a lawyer to help he keep his job. The judge wanted to see paperwork. And he wanted everything documented, which, I mean, that's not asking too much there. No. (laughs) Sounds like pretty standard practice. He just wanted clear proof of things. He didn't want Jonathan to stand up there and rattle off everything from memory anymore. Okay, see, that's not a bad thing. No. And the judge told Jonathan that he really needed to check himself because the way that he was doing things was completely unacceptable. It sounds like this is not the typical way that Jonathan handled things, though. So it does make me wonder if he was intentionally doing it and going off memory rather than specific facts or documents so that he could draw attention away from all the scandals in the case. Oh. I don't know. Interesting way of thinking of it. was something going on that just had him super rattled? That was my original thought, but... I mean, that could actually be a good point. You never know. Yeah. I mean, something had him acting different than normal because people were noticing. Court was adjourned again. It was Monday evening when Jonathan walked out of the courtroom, and at this point, he had less than 36 hours left to live. 
The next time they were in court, Jonathan began disclosing information that he had previously worked so hard to suppress. God, I already forgot. Okay. Yes. <laughs> this took me by surprise so much. It was like, wait, what? He only has 36 hours? And I was like, oh, oh, right, right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. My brain is going back again and catching back up now. I know, because there's so many stories happening. That just, like, took me off guard for a second. Yeah. <laughs> I already <laughs> forgot. Okay, we're all um, back on. True crime podcast, that's right. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, that is what's happening here. Okay, all right, I'm back on board. <laughs> so Jonathan asked FBI informant Warren Graves if he had ever violated the conditions of his plea agreement, and he said yes. He asked him what he did to violate those conditions, and Warren admitted in front of the jury that he took his ankle bracelet off so that he could go to the gym, get food, ride around, or whatever else he needed to do. He told them all he had Vaseline ankles. Oh, yes. Well, at least he was honest, though, because, like, for real, if he tried to deny that shit, like, I don't know what to tell you, dude. Right. <laughs> and, yeah, and they needed him to, you know, discuss this, so obviously they have to bring it up. He wanted to disclose it to the jury so that it didn't look like they were hiding anything when it inevitably came out at some point. Jonathan also had him explain how he had been working with agents and purchasing heroin. Warren Grace said that his vehicle was searched every time by the agents, and during one of the searches, the FBI found heroin in the ceiling flap in front of his vehicle the ceiling flap yeah <laughs> you know just i don't know why that ceiling flap that got me <laughs> he claimed that it was part of making it look like he was fully back on the streets uh he had to keep up certain appearances is what he was getting at he had different guys that were in and out of his vehicle he had to build up that street cred because there were already rumors that he was working with the police well gee i wonder why hmm because he can't keep his mouth shut right. i don't know <laughs> he claimed that he later learned that a friend left the heroin in his vehicle it wasn't his oh, oh. <laughs> you know how that goes Stop. i mean every time you watch <laughs> cops everybody's like that's not mine they're not my pants <laughs> it's always they're a friend it's a friend's yeah. backpack my friend drove my car recently y'all have some bad friends who's the friend i <laughs> uh, can't say their name i forgot i don't know <laughs> they're a friend but i just don't know i've only seen them one time yeah i'm not sure what their name is every time but I'm wearing their pants. I mean, really, that's classic, though. That's a classic one. It is. It is. So, yeah. A friend left the drugs in the ceiling flap of his vehicle, I Damn guess. Damn it, friend. Uh, we went over this in part one of the story. The drugs were found in the vehicle on the very same day that the Dawson family was murdered. Or was that part two? That was part two. It was one of the parts. It was part two. Okay. Um, which means that it was actually on October 16th of 2002. So when the judge asked Jonathan what date this incident occurred, that should have been pretty easy. Uh, but he lied and said that he could not recall. And he had Warren Grace say that it was the summer of 2003 that the drugs were found. Oh, this information had not been provided in the discovery, and the defense attorneys were not happy about this. Jonathan claimed that this information had been shown when the FBI showed Ken Ravenel, which is Dion Smith's attorney, the heroin that was recovered from the vehicle. But he insisted that it never happened. Ravenel also discovered many discrepancies in the paperwork, and he drew the judge's attention to this. He said, you know what? I feel like this is just a cover-up. And he asked for a mistrial. The judge said he would sleep on it and get back to everybody with a decision in the morning. But he did mention again that he was sick and tired of having his time wasted. So he told everyone, he was like, guess what? If you show up late to this courtroom again, you will be fined $25. The next morning... At 9.30 a.m., the courtroom was filled, but Jonathan Luna wasn't there. He arrived several minutes late, and he told the judge that he was at the hospital visiting his infant son. Judge Quarles fined him $25. Now, I suppose he wasn't just upset about Jonathan being late. Several developments had also been transpiring overnight. 
Judge Quarles had arranged a meeting between defense attorneys and officials at pretrial services. At the meeting, Todd Stokes and Barbara Skidmore of pretrial services disclosed some information about the government's handling of Warren Grace. Ruh -ruh. Yeah. The defense lawyers found out that the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI ignored all of the concerns from pretrial services and let Warren Grace run loose on the streets. Literally. Yeah. Just let him go. Yeah. Todd Stokes had initially followed the standard procedures when he sent that long memo to the judge asking to return him to jail, but the FBI intervened. That's when they made a comment that putting him back in jail would, quote, hurt the government's case down the line. That meant that the government was fully aware of what they were doing, and they knew it was wrong. Um, I mean, obviously. Uh, I was going to say, I don't want to dig myself into a hole here, but... yeah. I mean, that's Get digging. pretty typical of the government. Sure, sure. So I'm just going to leave that there. Well, there was proof in the documents that Jonathan Luna had been covering things up. Like, if you looked close enough, it was there. The defense lawyers, Archangelo Tuminelli, who goes by Archie, and... That was a cool freaking name, though. Yeah, Archangelo Tuminelli. I, you said it twice in a row? Yeah. I am impressed. <laughs> I practiced a lot. <laughs> no, like, I'm legitimately impressed. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, Archie Tuminelli and Ken Ravenel wanted a new trial. At this point, the judge could have thrown out the entire case altogether, and then Smith and Poindexter would walk free due to all the misconduct and conspiracies. It's obvi obviously like a risk to the public, though, to just send them out and let them go. Right. But it's also a risk for the defendants as well. Defendants who ask for a mistrial and have that granted waive their rights to protection against double jeopardy. So they could and would be tried again. Oh. Mm -hmm. So this really wouldn't be good for their clients. Tuminelli officially withdrew Poindexter's motion for a mistrial. In light of the scandal, he just wanted the case to be dismissed. But he was like, guess what? My schedule is super full in the next few months. So if they did a retrial, his client would have to sit in jail for about six to nine months. And that's not... A quick retrial. That is pretty rough, actually. Yeah. Besides, it was the government's fault because they failed to disclose information. Ravenel also put in a request for his client to withdraw the motion for a mistrial, but asked for the case to be thrown out. Rather than a dismissal, the judge offered a brief recess so that they could go over information and kind of figure out what the hell was actually going on here. The defense lawyers requested that Warren Grace be isolated from Luna, Skinner, and Moody because they kind of seemed to have their hands in all of the scandals that were surrounding him. They requested that he be placed in the custody, custody of U.S. Marshals. No more transporting him back and forth. No more deals. The defense lawyers had just learned about that secret conjugal visit that Warren Grace had with his lady prior to testifying. So weird. Yeah. Ultimately, Judge Quarles looked at everything and decided that he did not want to burden the marshals with this. Jonathan Luna chimed in at this point and said he had, in fact, given everything required over to the defense. So <laughs> instead of giving them a copy, of the missing documents as required, he placed an entire box in front of them and said, y'all can just sift through it and compare with what you have and see if anything's been left out. <laughs> there you go. Uh, box. <laughs> His shenanigans did actually work. No, they didn't. Yeah. It, it, the judge said, you know what? We're good to go. The court's back in session. Shut up. I did not think that was going to work. Come I didn't on. either. I was like, dude, what on earth are you actually doing I, here? I like, thought for sure that's probably happened before. Like, uh. <laughs> I just, all right. I, okay. Yeah. 
So the jurors were sent out for a short recess, and the judge informed FBI informant Warren Grace that defense lawyers are going to interview him at some point during the trial. And he said it would be an undecided place and an undecided time. So there's really no way. Yeah. Like, you can't prepare for it. It's going to happen, though. Yeah. He was not to have any further conversations with Agent Skinner, the other agents or officers, or Jonathan Luna. Things were heating up in the courtroom on Jonathan Luna's last day alive. Judge Quarles ordered an investigation into the FBI's handling of Warren Grace, and he needed to announce a plea agreement that would put a stop to this. Jonathan knew what he needed to do, and he knew it was not legal. They were getting ready to head into the weekend, and it looked like it was going to be a long one. The defense lawyers were getting snappier about the missing documents that Jonathan was not providing them, and they planned to cross-examine Warren Grace that following Monday. Ken Ravenel asked the judge for a number that they could be reached at over the weekend. He said, you know what, let's go ahead and update you and tell you if things are progressing here. And the judge was like, uh, no, I do not intend to work over the weekend. (laughs) So that's not happening. I feel that. (laughs) The jurors were going to have Friday off, and they were potentially going to have Monday off as well. So they did need to get things figured out. The defense wasn't sure if they were going to be ready by Monday, so they wanted to contact a court clerk and have them call each jury member to let them know if things were going to be delayed until Tuesday, if need be. But the judge was like, no, I am not having my court clerk go through that. So they sent everybody to lunch, and Jonathan Luna spent his last lunch hour scrambling to cover up this conspiracy. Court reconvened from lunch at 2 p.m., and Jonathan Luna offered up a plea agreement to Smith & Poindexter. This deal would drastically cut their prison sentences. Smith would be facing about 10 years, and Poindexter could be facing 15. Without that deal, they both were looking at as much as 60 years in prison. That's a dramatic change. It's huge. It was a sweet deal. Sure, they had grounds for an appeal due to all the information about war and grace being withheld, But it doesn't guarantee that Smith and Poindexter would actually win that. This was something they actually had to take seriously. Poindexter also had the murder case hanging over him. It would be huge if they could remove time for both clients. Smith and Poindexter immediately accepted Jonathan's plea offer, but there was a catch. Of course. They wanted the plea agreement to resolve all outstanding issues. They wanted the government to drop charges against Walter Poindexter for the drug murder of Alvin Jones. Oh. And Jonathan Luna knew that he himself did not have the power to do that. He promised that he would not ask the judge to connect the murder to the case, but federal rules do say that he must prosecute a drug-related murder charge. Jonathan could not have been in a tougher spot here. He couldn't give them what they wanted, but he had to do it because it was important for him to get this trial over with. If they made a deal, the trial would be over and the jury would be sent home. That would mean there's no examination of Warren Grace and the conspiracy is covered up. Jonathan Luna announced to the judge that they had reached terms for a plea agreement that was acceptable to the defendants and the government. He said that he could lay the terms out verbally, but he felt that the government and counsel would prefer to reduce it to writing. Judge Quarles was not buying this, and he said, guess what? I'm refusing to send the jury home until this is done, just in case. He told him, get it all written down by 3.30 p.m., Archie Tuminelli chimed in to let the judge know that, quote, Mr. Luna has advised me that he will not, at sentencing, seek to have the court find the murder was related to this case. I don't know if he's going to be able to put that in a written agreement for whatever reason. Ken Ravenel pointed out another issue. 
If Deion Smith was found to be an armed career offender, they might want to get out of the deal. If Deion Smith pleaded guilty for the agreement, he wanted to withdraw the plea if the judge issued him a really long sentence, and he wanted this to be added into the agreement. So okay, there's a lot sorry. of no, moving was, that, parts here. That was me processing what you were saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Quarles announced that they would continue with the trial then. He was like, screw it. That doesn't sound like we can make a deal. Trial's going forward. Jonathan Luna was like, no, no, no. We can do this. We can get this taken care of. He had to find a way to get rid of evidence. So this didn't look like a drug-related murder or, you know, reek of a conspiracy. By the time court let out for the day, Jonathan had not completed that plea agreement, and he had less than 12 hours left before his life was brutally ended. This is insane listening to the countdown. Isn't this weird? It is. I know. Just knowing it's like building up and what's coming. And now as you're getting further into it, I'm like, I wonder how much time is left. I wonder how much time is left. I know. Jonathan Luna and defense attorneys Ken Ravenel and Archie Tuminelli left the courtroom and got in a heated argument over the plea agreement. It was actually so disruptive and loud that they were asked to go somewhere else. Okay, well, that's actually pretty bad. It is, yeah. So, I mean, other people in the office are like, oh my gosh, you guys, you got to take this somewhere else. At the meeting, Dion Smith agreed to plead guilty to one count of distribution of heroin and possession of a firearm for purposes of drug trafficking. Walter Poindexter agreed to plead guilty to three counts of heroin distribution. The conspiracy counts were going to be dropped against both. Archie Tuminelli demanded that as part of that deal, all charges for the murder of Alvin Jones would need to be dropped. Jonathan just wasn't sure how to make this happen, and at some point during that night, he went to an assistant U.S. attorney to discuss the plea deal. But they actually don't have the power to approve or even offer the deal, so it is interesting that he went to talk to this person. The deal needs to be approved by higher-ups, and in many jurisdictions, that would mean the criminal chief approves the deals, but in other jurisdictions, it would be the U.S. attorney. That means that his boss, Tom DiBaggio, or his chief criminal prosecutor had to have been looped into that deal at some point that night. Jonathan Luna and Arky Tuminelli met with Assistant U.S. Attorney James Warwick, and this was to get some advice. And they were pretty vague about things, but finally Warwick just flat out asked, is there any proof or evidence that Alvin Jones's murder was drug-related? Could it be tied to the Stash House drug conspiracy? If we're being honest, the answer is definitely yes. But James Warwick also asked if Jonathan Luna had any proof that Walter Poindexter killed Alvin Jones in drug-related circumstances. There were reports submitted in the court documents, several witnesses, and interviews with Warren Grace that would all provide that proof. Hell, the judge was even aware of the drug-related murder. Right. But Jonathan looked at James Warwick and said he didn't have any evidence. And he said, okay, without evidence, it was possible to issue that plea agreement stating the murder would not be prosecuted. This is wild. It really is, because there's a lot of people getting involved here. James Warwick even conferred with others in the U.S. Attorney's Office on this. So there you have it. If Jonathan Luna wanted to make this case disappear so there wasn't an investigation into the mishandling of FBI informant Warren Grace he would need to make sure some of the evidence just went away so they could get that plea deal. Wouldn't it be the first time it just went away? Of course not. Arky Tuminelli and Jonathan Luna needed the local prosecutor to agree to the deal. That night, they contacted head Baltimore homicide prosecutor, assistant state attorney Mark Cohen, to ask him to sign off on the deal. Mark Cohen agreed to drop the murder charges, but there was a condition. He wanted to get permission from Alvin Jones's parents first, which is very respectful. Jonathan went home for dinner that night and promised to head back to the office later to finalize the plea agreement in time for court the next morning. 
He returned to the office around 8.48 p.m. Attorney Tuminelli says that his caller ID showed that Jonathan called him by cell at 9.06 p.m. He said he had to go home again, but he would go back to the office. Office? The office. He would go back to the office to finish up. (laughs) There you go. Oh, my God. (laughs) You know what? Yeah. Just like, that's right up there with, we were, when we were going to a show recently and Isaac was pointing out something about Pizza Ranch and he was like, Oh, look, Pizza Ranch. <laughs> that's, what, that's what that reminded me of. And ever since then, I'm like, it's Pizza Ranch. There you go. <laughs> well, <laughs> the office at Pizza Ranch. Yep. <laughs> uh, I needed that. You're welcome. <laughs> Jonathan told him that he had completed Dion Smith's paperwork, but he still had to write it for Walter Poindexter. He was unsure about the terms for his, though. He called Archie Tuminelli at home to discuss the details, and then he was going to fax the completed agreement to him sometime that night. They talked for about five to ten minutes, and Archie Tuminelli never received that fax. I just love it every time you say his name. You really like that one? I do. I don't know why, but I just freaking love the sound of it. I've never heard it before, but it is cool. Every time you say it, I'm just like, ah, it's so cool. (laughs) Don't worry. It's in here more. Oh, yes. (laughs) At 9.30 p.m., attorney Ken Ravenel says that Jonathan left him a voicemail saying he was working on the agreement, but he never received the facts that night either. It's impossible to know exactly what Jonathan was doing on his last night, and there are a lot of questions surrounding the timeline. He told the defense lawyers he was going home, but he didn't go right away. It seems like he stayed in the office for about two more hours, so maybe he was working on that plea agreement? Or was he with someone else? We don't have solid proof that he was alone that night. Dun, dun, dun! (laughs) Did he walk away from his desk by himself, or did somebody lure him out? One of the biggest mysteries is why he left his cell phone and glasses at his desk. Now, to me, it sounds like it could be somebody that thinks they're not going to be gone for that long from their desk. You know, maybe they're going to be right back, or they were brought away by force. Right, because you just don't, like, you just don't forget those things. It's very strange to forget both items right. like you can forget a cell phone or forget your glasses sure but to forget both but i think you said he needed those glasses to be able to like drive and shit right yeah so yeah. you don't forget so, your glasses when you, you can't see it would definitely i mean that would be a good reason as to why he forgot his phone because he couldn't see but sure <laughs> i'm just yeah. like i think you would notice as you're going down the hallway sure or out the ramp like right. oh i cannot see yeah so. yeah that would that would do it Yeah. The author of the book that I read pointed out that there were security flaws in the building that Jonathan worked in. There were about 175 employees working out of the federal building office. Nearly all drivers of delivery trucks, such as like UPS, FedEx, USPS, they all unload their trucks in the street and then they use a cart to deliver items into the building. The only one who doesn't have to follow this procedure is the dry cleaning trucks that pick up the judge's laundry. They're allowed to pull right up to the courthouse door. The security is described as relaxed for insiders. The security check, metal detector, and sign-in sheet is only meant for strangers. I get it, but... Yeah. I mean, in a courthouse, that's scary. (sighs) That's That's what I'm saying, like... That doesn't feel like the best plan. Because these are risky jobs. Yeah, even if it's a regular, like, Mm -hmm. it just doesn't feel like a good plan. And courthouse employees are often waved through the line and told to just sign in later so that they can move people through quickly. So if it's busy, Uh, it's like, oh, I recognize you, go on through. Again, I get it because you know them and they work there, but also that's exactly how people get their in- By doing stuff like that. Yeah, because you need to follow proper procedures for safety. I mean, I know it's a pain in the ass, but it's worth it. 
The author was told that several assistant U.S. attorneys carry guns, which they routinely check in when they enter the courthouse. But that's, of course, only if they're asked to sign in that day. FBI agents who enter the courthouse do not need to sign in or out, which I find that okay. interesting. Yeah. Per the Justice Department timeline, Jonathan Luna's car was recorded leaving the courthouse's parking garage at 11.38 p.m. He walked out of his office, leaving an unfinished plea agreement that had to be ready for that morning. And his glasses that he needed to drive. Yep, and his phone. He drove his silver 2003 Honda Accord away from the parking garage. Was he meeting somebody in the middle of the night? Was he in a hurry? Did he leave his phone so he wouldn't be traced? I've seen that a lot, and I think that's an interesting theory. However, it doesn't explain the glasses. Nope. You know, and did this have something to do with the plea deal? That did seem to be top priority that night. He was worried about losing his job, and he even hired a lawyer to help him, so he obviously cared about staying employed here. Dan Smith's paperwork was completed and printed that night. Walter Poindexter's paperwork contained typos, handwritten crossouts, insertions, and amendments that were directly lifted from a draft of Dion Smith's plea deal, and it was not completed. Jonathan Luna had already been fined $25 that morning in court for being late, and I'm sure that was a little embarrassing, too. So he certainly wouldn't have wanted to be late the next morning as well. Is it possible that he didn't finish Walter Poindexter's plea agreement because he knew it was illegal? Is it possible he didn't want to go through with this anymore? Did he tell somebody that night that he couldn't do it? His friend Dan Rivera believes that he was intentionally and sneakily trying to expose the FBI and force the judge to do an investigation without making it look like he was doing that. Okay. Which is very interesting. It's it's a theory. It is. Jonathan had an easy pass in his vehicle. And I, this is going to get kind of confusing. And I did my best to look into this. I don't fully understand at all. Um, but he used this easy pass so that he could quickly get through toll gates, bridges, or tunnels. After he left the parking garage that night, he used his easy pass north on I-95 at the Fort McHenry Tunnel Toll Plaza at 11.49 p.m., which is about 10 minutes after he left the garage. He traveled along Kennedy Highway and arrived at another set of toll booths at Perryville, where I-95 crosses the Susquehanna River. He passed through the toll plaza at 12.28 a.m., and he passed through the state line toll booth at 12.46 a.m. at Elkton, Maryland. At 12.57, Jonathan Luna's debit card was used at an ATM at the Kennedy Plaza rest stop. $200 was withdrawn from his account. The video cameras in the lobby were not able to capture a usable image for the transaction. I thought for sure you were going to say they weren't working. Dude. I'm so friggin' frustrated about this. FBI agents in Delaware worked under the agent in charge of the Baltimore office. At the time of Jonathan's disappearance, acting special agent in charge Jennifer Smith Love had been newly charged with overseeing FBI agents in Maryland and Delaware. What if he was meeting with an agent that night? According to the book, the rest stop that he went to lies about halfway between Baltimore and Philadelphia, so he could have maybe been meeting somebody halfway. In the weeks leading up to the Smith and Poindexter trial, Jonathan had been driving to the Philadelphia Federal Detention Facility to meet up with the witness, Warren Grace. So this wasn't unfamiliar territory to him. Why withdraw the $200, though? Does that mean he's buying something? Or paying someone? Or was it somebody else altogether that pulled the money out? I suppose because they don't have the camera. Exactly. Yeah. So we don't know. And that's one of the reasons why I say like his vehicle left that parking garage because I don't know. We don't even have proof that he was the one that was driving when he left that garage. 
That, okay. They haven't even released that footage. Okay. Which, that irritates me. Jonathan did not use the Easy Pass after this stop. And the tolls were paid with cash. At least one turnpike ticket was taken and returned. He had already left his cell phone behind. So maybe he was really worried about being tracked and decided, you know what, I'm just going to use cash the rest of the time. But if that was the case, again, I know I said it before, it doesn't explain the glasses. No, it doesn't, because that's actually where, like, my brain was kind of going with it. I was like, I just wonder if he just didn't want, like, the easy pass to click Mm -hmm. under his name, and that's where he was. Right. But, you, yeah. And then again, I also wonder why you would take out the $200, because that's traceable. Right. So, you know, that's where I get kind of tripped up when when people point so hard to this easy pass as like, oh, you didn't want to be traced. I'm like... I don't know, because then you're making other mistakes that are traceable. No, that's true. That's very true. On March 12th of 2004, the FBI released a timeline that lists the route that they believe Jonathan took on the night of his death. At 2.37 a.m., his car entered the New Jersey Turnpike at exit 6A on the east shore of the Delaware River, entering from Route 130, which runs along the eastern shore. This is located about an hour and 40 minutes from the ATM where the money was withdrawn. This is not a direct route. What would be the reason for this? Could that mean that the person driving his car might have been recognized by locals or local officers if they were seen? New Jersey Route 130 is a back road that runs parallel to the very busy and heavily traveled New Jersey Turnpike. It's an industrial road that is very known to locals. This isn't a road that outsiders would take. Jonathan Luna was a New Yorker, and he would have no reason to really be on this road or know it. The author of the book also points out that several federal law enforcement agencies, including the Drug Enforcement Agency, kept facilities near the Philadelphia airport which is surrounded by stretches of warehouses and desolate roads. So why would Jonathan be there? Was he meeting a federal agent or an informant? Hopefully not. I mean, there's so many questions. Yeah. Yeah. At 2.37, his car left Route 130 and entered the New Jersey Turnpike heading west towards the Delaware River into Pennsylvania. God, it's almost worse when you know there's a countdown. I know. And, like, his car is going everywhere. This is so weird. After a 10-minute drive, his vehicle reached the Delaware River, just south of Trenton, and entered the Pennsylvania Turnpike at 2.47 a.m. At 3.20 a.m., Jonathan's debit card was used to buy gas at the Peter J. Camiel rest stop past King of Prussia, on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. That was a lot of words. Lots. <laughs> now, somehow, the security cameras failed here, too. Yeah, of course. Okay. They did that magical thing where anytime any type of crime is involved, poof. And I'm trying so hard to not say conspiracy things here. <laughs> <laughs> But, oh, yeah, I, I mean, suppose. am I supposed to believe that this is a coincidence? Mm. That he goes to two places, completely unrelated, and bam, suddenly the cameras don't work at this exact moment? It It is always sketch when it happens. I mean, you do know, of course, that certain people in power can make certain camera Things footage go away, go away. Oh, yeah, for sure and so i'll just leave that there okay. and that that's a theory that's it it's a it's a theory yep money had been withdrawn from the atm earlier so why does he need to use his card now and don't get me wrong i realize that you can take money out and still use your card in your same in the same day but it just seemed a little odd to me because i'm like okay then what was that money even for right 
Days after this incident, employees at the King of Prussia rest stop did talk to newspaper reporters, and they said that a man resembling Jonathan Luna came into the store and bought two drinks. A waitress at a restaurant off the Pennsylvania Turnpike told reporters that he came into her restaurant earlier, uh, early that morning. Jonathan's car left the Turnpike at exit 286 at 4.04 a.m. So that's about a 45-minute drive to the Route 222 exit from the King of Prussia Turnpike Plaza. And the ticket given to the toll booth collector was later found to have a small spot of Jonathan's blood on it. Ooh, what? Yeah. Oh. So that's very strange information. His car was abandoned about two miles from the Turnpike exit on State Route 897, which is a desolate area. Around 5.30 a.m., Jonathan's body was discovered near the Turnpike exit. He was face down in a stream under the front of his idling car. He was fully dressed in his courtroom business suit, shirt and tie, overcoat, and court shoes. He was wearing his magnetic courthouse ID badge on a necklace. The car had turned off Dry Tavern Road and went up the driveway belonging to the Sensenig and Weaver Well Drilling Company. Ron Weaver, one of the company owners, said that a streetlight had burned out on the back corner of the building parking lot. Do you say Ron or wrong? Ron. Oh, it's like wrong? No, Ron. Wrong Weaver. Ron Weaver. <laughs> Got it. Got did it. Did I say wrong? No, I think that my brain just thought you did. Okay. Well, I guess I don't know. We'll find out other. later. Yeah. It'll be a fun surprise. One of us said one of them. So there we go. Yes, one of us did say one of them. Yeah, there nice. we go. <laughs> um, so one of the street lights was out in the back parking lot. This area was normally lit, but on this night, it was dark. It was a cold morning, and the ground was covered in frost. Tiger prints were in the frost, um, and that would show that Jonathan's car had actually first been parked behind the building in the dark, but that's not where his car or his body would later end up. The tracks show that his car left the back of the building and headed down the driveway toward the road, then made a super sharp left turn, leaving the driveway and heading into the grass. The car drove a 100 or so feet across the lawn before getting the front tires hung up on the embankment side of the creek. Blood was found smeared on the driver's side door and front fender, and Jonathan's body was curled in the fetal position under his front bumper, face down in the water. An employee was just arriving to work that morning. Daniel Geeman arrived at 5 a.m. and made himself a cup of coffee. Around 5.30 a.m., he went outside into the back parking lot to get the equipment ready for the day. He saw an odd red light glowing in the dark by the creek. Oh, no. So he pointed a drilling truck's headlights in that direction of the glowing light. and like a taillight or something. He saw a vehicle on the edge of the narrow creek bed. Another employee was just arriving at the same time, and so the two of them walked towards the car. And that's when they saw blood smeared on the outside of the car. The red light on the dashboard was glowing, and there was a baby seat in the back of the car. But it was empty. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't remember just to that. It like, gave me a mini heart attack. It was empty. <gasps> so Daniel called 911, and the state troopers arrived around 5.45 a.m., and they believed that this was a car accident. Um, they thought maybe it was a drunk driver. This was a really strange spot to find a vehicle because the area was all farmland with wide open fields. They don't get a lot of traffic there, and it's so remote that the locals don't even travel in those parts very often. I wish we didn't get a lot of people here. (laughs) Yeah? (laughs) Too many cars on the road. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) When the police noticed a body lying face down in the creek in front of the car, they contacted Lancaster County Coroner Dr. Barry Walp, and he arrived around 8 a.m., he observed the scene and it was not a car accident because 
There was a knife sticking out of Jonathan Luna's neck. <sighs> that'll do it. So, yeah, that'll that'll be a pretty solid reason. Not a car accident. Although I'm going to say by the last couple of stories we've covered, <laughs> mm-hmm. a knife in the neck could still somehow be blamed on them or blamed on him. Like, oh, he hit a bump and stabbed himself in the neck and then pulled it out and stabbed himself again. Sorry. Funny you should say that. No, shut up. We'll we'll get to that in a, a while. No! So no! Keep that tucked in your brain. No! Yeah. You can't do this to me again! <laughs> this is a widely debated suicide or homicide mm-hmm. case. No! It really Megan, is. Megan! Yeah. You're messing with me. Uh, you know what? I actually wish I was. Oh my god, stop. I am okay. sure not. I don't even I was ah, uh, I know you were joking. I was totally kidding. Yeah. When I said that because it just happened so many times in the last few episodes. Mhm. We're seriously going to go down that road again? We have to. Ah. Uh, yeah. We are heading there. Okay. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And also, just so that everybody is aware, too, all of the facts uh, regarding the state that the vehicle was found in or Jonathan's body, this is all widely um, dividing the internet as well. Okay. So, <laughs> everything is debated. Every little piece. Right, which is, like, exactly like what we've been covering. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I knew you wanted another one. Yeah, thanks. That's exactly what I was looking for. I know. I know what you like. (laughs) Apparently. (laughs) So. This isn't a fucking cold case, is it? Oh, yeah. Megan! (laughs) (laughs) Did I forget to say that? I hate you so much right now. (laughs) Oops. (laughs) <laughs> oh, why are you like this? Okay. All right. Well, okay. Uh, so. <laughs> is there anything else you need to tell me? I don't think so. Okay. You'll find it all out. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Blood was smeared on the driver's side door and left front fender of the vehicle. There were numerous bills scattered throughout the interior of the vehicle, and by bills, I do mean money. The vehicle was running, and there was no apparent damage to the interior or exterior of the vehicle, so it didn't look like there was a car accident. Jonathan Luna was declared dead at the scene. There was a large pool of blood on the right rear floor of the car, and... Blood was smeared on the driver's side door and left front fender. The blood had seeped through the front seat to the uh, floor in the back. There was cell phone equipment inside the car, which no article has ever really said what that actually means, but that could just mean like a cell phone cord or something like that. But his cell phone was back at his office. There was potentially... $30 in bills lying inside the car, but it was later reported as $200, according to the Washington Post. I don't believe that the true amount has ever been released, and it is my guess that um, they said $200 because that's how much he took out at the ATM. Oh, that makes sense. So I think that's where that number came from. There were bills in the back of the car, but the amount's never been said or confirmed. Jonathan was wearing a North Carolina law school ring decorated with scales of justice, and his name was engraved on the side. I'm going to go through some of the wounds, but every single one is disputed. Both of his hands were badly lacerated, full of knife slashes. The deep cuts were between each of his fingers. Oh! Oh, no! I know. I can't! And <laughs> that just made it's, oh, it it's made me so cringe. Bad. It made me cringe everywhere. Oh. I know. You and there were cuts on the front and back of both hands. The cuts in between the fingers were so deep that the skin was peeling away. Oh. And oh, in this some, is up there with eyeballs. I know. In some places it was down to the bone. 
He had been stabbed in the back several times, and the wounds were in the middle of his back and near his shoulder blades. And I saw that look on your face as you just threw that nasty little look <laughs> over to me. <laughs> I wasn't sure when you I actually s- caught it because I didn't look all the way over. <laughs> yeah, I caught it. Yes, these are in the back. We're really going down this road again. Yeah. And it's debated again. Yeah. Uh, I know. He cuts all over his hands. Mm-hmm. Stabs in the back. Yes. And we're seriously doing this again. Yeah, we are. Oh, okay. This is happening. <sighs> all right. All right. All right. <sighs> I'm going to be so mad. Okay. His neck was cut open on the right side, and it went all the way around his throat. The slit to his throat was several inches deep in some spots. His... Again, this is debated. (laughs) His scrotum had been slashed. (gasps) In total, he had 36 stab wounds, but many of the wounds were shallow. The autopsy report was sealed, and, I mean, that certainly doesn't help the rumor mill. After Jonathan's death, Baltimore Sun reporter Gail Gibson, I mean, did not even skip a beat. He hadn't even had his funeral yet, and this reporter jumped into action to write about money that had gone missing in 2002. And I had briefly touched on this, and the money is going to be very, very important, and we're going to go in-depth later in the story. But this was one day after he had been found dead, when the Baltimore Sun ran a story where Gail Gibson said that, quote, authorities also were combing through Luna's work files to determine whether the motive behind his killing could be found in any of the cases he was prosecuting. Late last year, Luna won convictions in a string of violent Baltimore County bank robberies in a curious trial that produced its own mystery. At the end of the trial, authorities discovered that more than $36,000 in cash disappeared somewhere between the courtroom and the government storage area used to hold evidence during trials. That case was never solved. That is a lot of money. It is a lot of money. Two days after his death, Time magazine published a story called Unnamed FBI Sources. The article says, quote, FBI examination of internet postings found messages on adult sites placed by Jonathan Luna seeking female sex partners. Okay, first off, why the fuck does that matter in this? Well, it says investigators found he had debt problems, including credit cards his wife did not know about. (sighs) The article goes on to say, That the FBI did an examination of internet postings where they found Jonathan Luna seeking female sex partners, but someone else could have posted them because there was a Jonathan Luna, like another one, who was a convicted sex offender. But the FBI claimed that it was signed with Jonathan's three initials backwards. Uh, And I agree with you, Hannah. Like, why is the FBI releasing a story? Before they even have the facts here, because they're like, no, it could have been him, but they have no idea. Well, and I don't even know why anybody's releasing a story anyways. Like, the dude just freaking died. Like, damn. They really don't hold back. They just jump right into releasing shit like that. And it sort of feels like they're intentionally trying to destroy his reputation. Yes, yes. Are we honestly supposed to believe that a married attorney and prosecutor that is very well known in the public would post his real name on a site to look for female partners? I mean, sure, it's possible. But like, it does happen. But he would have been, I feel like he would have been a lot smarter about it if he was choosing to do that, considering I, what his job is. I think so, too. I think it sounds really, really strange. The police did allegedly investigate this online dating profile, and it was believed that this could have, have like, a possible connection to his death. The online post was six years prior to his death. And yes, he was married at that time, but we still don't know if he's the one that posted this. This was in 2003, though. 
How do we still not know if this was his online profile or not? That's a good point. Yeah. Like, no. I mean, come on. You, you would think you'd be able to figure that out. It just doesn't seem that complicated, especially with the technology that we have nowadays. Right. So if you're going to honestly tell me that we don't have any idea if it's his, then it's not his in my mind. I honestly have to agree with that. Because that's ridiculous, and I don't like how quickly that got pushed out to the right. public. Another story was released soon after this, and it suggested that Jonathan's genitals were mutilated as a form of, like, emasculation. Okay, so they're just throwing everything out there right now. Yeah, absolutely everything. They're kind of like, what's going to stick? see what is going to stick. That's exactly what I was going to say. Now, this was no longer a death that would be prosecuted as a federal crime because investigators were moving towards the theory of this being a result of a personal relationship, not a work-related crime. When Jonathan's computer was being searched, the public was told that he had encrypted parts of his hard drive, and that made it sound like he had something to hide. But in reality, I honestly think a lot of government employees encrypt their computers. I was thinking the same thing. Like, I don't know a shit ton about this stuff, but I really feel like they do. Yeah, and when you have clients like they do, I just feel like you would kind of have to. You would think so. It was discovered that Jonathan had sent emails to friends where he said that he was overwhelmed with debt from his student loans. Uh, He went to law school. I'm sure his bills were atrocious. That makes sense to complain about that. Yeah, I guess I'm confused as to why that's like such a big deal here. Well, because they're trying to pin the missing money money on on him. him. Yeah. Yeah, but... If he took the missing money, wouldn't he been able to get rid of some of that debt? Thank you. Yes. I agree. Because, I like, wrote that in my notes. I was like, how would we not have found that missing money in his account or notice that some of his debts just suddenly went away? Suddenly got paid off, right? Yeah. Especially ones that are worth that much. Like, Right. Why would he be complaining to people? About being in debt if he had. If he suddenly came into $36,000. Right. Like, obviously, you can still be in debt, but you're going to be sure. in a lot less debt and a lot less concerned at that point. Yes. Now, he also mentioned that there were some problems in his marriage. And to me, I guess, like, I don't really take that as a bombshell either. But <laughs> they thought that they could just go ahead and leak that information and that would be really cool. Which isn't theirs to... No. That is not, yeah. No. A lot of people are stressed about marriage and student loans. Like, who isn't? Everybody's well, when, got something. When you have a job like that, too, I know it is very stressful in home life. And he was working a crazy amount of hours. That's what I'm saying. And it trying gets, to keep his job. It gets very stressful, yeah, for yeah. the home life and everything. Like, yeah. Mm hmm. I guess I didn't, when you said it, it didn't even phase me, so. I know. I, I just was like, when I was reading through the articles, I thought, I just don't see how that's that Relevant. big of a deal. Yeah. yeah. No. The day after Jonathan's death, FBI agents were telling the Baltimore press that his death was the result of a personal relationship that had gone bad. So there's no connection to his job. The FBI told a different story to his family, though. They told them that... This could be a hate crime, so the family should stop talking about it. Like, for their protection. Um, okay. Which, no. They just wanted to tarnish his name some more. Yeah. Reggie Shuford, Jonathan's friend from law school, was told by two FBI agents in May of 2004 that the results were inconclusive, but they were leaning towards suicide. They just don't get it. They believed Jonathan ended his own life, and they said it was in everyone's best interest to start saying that this was a suicide. Okay, that is terrifying to hear. Feels a little threatening, Uh, does it not? No, it definitely felt threatening. Because I was like, oh, that's why I was like, okay, that's terrifying because why, why is that in my best interest? Right. What is happening now? Mm-hmm. And everybody else's best interest, apparently. Yeah. 
So it's a lot of a lot of things that make you go, hmm. So that's where we're going to end this one. And next week, we will go over um, The Undertaker provided some information about the condition of Jonathan Luna's body when it was brought in. Okay, that I can't wait to hear, honestly. Yeah, so a lot of good information there. Um, there is a sex ring scandal running out of the Baltimore police headquarters. What? Mm-hmm. Oh, this is getting nuts, man. So lots of corruption happening there. The knife used in Jonathan's death is found. The what? plea. I yeah. thought he had one in him. Oh, <laughs> oh, there's an. Okay, you never mind. I get it. Next part. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Funny girl. <laughs> Uh, the plea agreement that Jonathan never finished for the Smith and Poindexter case did get completed after his death, and it was signed. So we will go over all of that next week. Okay. (laughs) All right. So make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a five-star review. If you love us, tell your friends, tell your cats. Um, Bye. bye. You're going to tell me you could remember that, but not what comes after welcome. (laughs) Welcome.